Hello and welcome to Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galpin and this is the show where you can have your property related questions answered by a team of property experts. And joining me today is Dave Ford, who's been here many times before now. Hello. Chartered construction manager and consultant on the construction side of the industry. Welcome to you. And somebody who's doing their first question time today, Nick Hewitt from the Property App. Welcome to you. Yeah, thanks for having me. All the way down from Scotland. Yeah. Well, well done. Hope the trip was okay. Um, Dave, I'm going to start off with you. The current labour shortages and the lack of foreign labour because of Brexit. How are we going to solve this? Are there enough apprenticeships? Are the people being trained for the new technologies for all the green projects? And um, how, how will this affect build costs for developers? Right. Well, first of all, we've got to ask, why a country like Britain was so dependent on cheap foreign mass labour, right? This goes all the way back to the early 90s when apprenticeships virtually stopped. It then carried on into uh, 2003 or four when we had the EU accession countries um, were allowed to come over. So we had a mass influx of cheap labour and let no one be under any misunderstanding at all, right? These people were here for one thing, because they were cheap, and they were here to be exploited by greedy employers. And then employers just didn't need to take on apprenticeships. Why do you, would you want to take on an apprentice, pay for them to go to college, teach them how to do the job, when you can just phone up an agency and so I made 10 chippies, plumber sparks here in the morning, get them for two weeks and get rid of them. You had Tony Blair's great idea that 50% of all school leavers would get a university degree. Apprenticeships weren't pushed. So we, we've created this situation. And when you say, are there enough apprenticeships, there's not. I mean, I read a statistic the other day, I think up to July of this year, 4,625 construction companies went bust. Now, let's say they had one apprentice each. That's 4,600 young lads, ladies, some of them, who are now flapping around trying to get someone to take over their apprenticeship. Um, we've got this massive push for net zero and decarbonisation uh, in the construction industry. Now, a lot... In the city of London, there's a lot of old historic buildings. How are you going to retrofit those buildings to modern uh, insulation requirements? For a start, you're dealing with grade two listed buildings, historic buildings. A lot of those traditional skills, they're all gone. You know, people who can work with stained glass windows, uh, people who know how to do lime plastering, all that stuff. We're not training that up at all. What the government have done to alleviate this temporary labour shortage, they've opened up lots of special visa categories. For example, they said there was a shortage of bricklayers. So now bricklayers can come in from all over the world. Then there was a shortage of scaffolders and so on and so forth. That's what they're doing. But this time, in, in, instead of getting people from Eastern Europe, they're getting people from India and Africa. That, that is not the answer, not at all. Um, we've also, you had IR35 come out. For people who don't know what that is, that's a tax regime for self-employed people. So not only have we got a labour shortage, we've had a mass exodus of top and mid-level management going to Dubai and Saudi Arabia. If you, you've not only got a skill shortage, you're now going to have a skills gap where all that accumulated knowledge is not passed down, which in turn, obviously, will lead to rising build costs for developers. Um, regarding the, are we training people up for the MMC and the new technologies? Well, MMC, Modern Methods of Construction, uh, that is purposely designed to be assembled by semi-skilled labour, right? So that, and that was to bring wages down as well. So that's not going to be such a problem. 
But when we talk about the new grown technologies, things like wind turbines and all that, that's a highly skilled job. Erecting those. I mean, I wouldn't fancy being on a boat in the North Sea in a storm, right? Bobbing up and down, having to get to one of those wind turbines, leap off, climb to the top and do maintenance on it. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but all right, that's all the doom and gloom. So what's the answer? Well, the answer's obvious. Pay people a decent wage and invest heavily in apprenticeships. They're talking about scrapping HS2. Now, that's the biggest project in Europe. Um, the amount of apprentices on there is probably the highest concentration in the country. So if they want to get rid of HS2, you're going to get rid of all them firms, you're going to get rid of all those apprentices. Mm. Really, you know, heavily investing in apprenticeships is the way forward. But you'll never hear the government talk about that. It's always, we want to be going into the 21st century, the leading uh, tech country, you know, IT, computer program. It, it's, it's never pushed construction trade apprenticeships. Mm. It's looked down on as a sort of lesser thing. Mm. Okay, all right, well, extensive answer for sure. Well, that's the truth, mate, you know. Anything to add to that, Nick? Yeah, I mean, just being in the construction industry for years, you, you see the massive influx of these people coming over and, and there's just very little in the way of apprentices. And, you know, how's the country supposed to be sustainable when the, when the, the skills aren't getting passed down to the next generation? Um, you know, it seems obvious you just need to get more apprentices and there needs to be more training. Yeah, I guess you're right. OK, Nick, we'll get on with your question now. Now, with some UK local authorities considering the imposition of rent caps, what do the panel think the consequences will be in terms of investment in residential property. Now, I, am I right in thinking in Scotland you do have rent caps? Yes, yeah, there's a rent freeze. And how's it working? Obviously, landlords are not happy with it. Um, it's not in line with inflation. Uh, so lots of landlords are looking to leave property. They don't want to be landlords anymore. People are maybe losing money. They're certainly not making an income like they used to. Um, so then you have people who are interested in property all of a sudden are not interested because they hear all the horror stories and they hear that you know the rent doesn't go up and um, obviously during COVID certain people just weren't paying their rent at all and it was a big big problem um, but yeah there's, a, there's already a massive housing shortage um, every year the government failed to reach the targets that they, they say they're going to so the buy to let market's just massively affected. You know, there's not enough properties, there's not enough homes for people to stay in. As an investor, there's other things you can do. You, you could look at service accommodation, you could look at obviously just flipping property, uh, short term holiday lets, but that all takes away from the where, where do people live? You know, sure. if there's no buy to lets or there's not enough buy to lets, you know, where are people going to live? Um, yeah, so yeah, it's a big, big problem. Have you seen a lot of people coming out of buy to let over this? Yes, yes. A lot. I mean, down down here, it's not the rent caps that have taken people out, but it was, it, it was, it's quite strange, really. I mean, a lot of people were very worried about the insulation requirements for buildings, so they thought, crap, we got to. Um, 2028 to get yep. it all sorted out. Now, of course, the government has said, oh, we're not doing it anyway. <laughs> and there's a lot of people come out of the market and sold their portfolios, yep. which, is, which is really such a shame because it just adds to the the, the shortage of property and, and therefore the spiralling prices, I suppose. Yep. Yeah. Have you had huge rent increases in uh, in Scotland? Have no, they gone I mean, I think they let them put up 3% or something. It About was, 3%. Yeah, and obviously inflation's gone up at like 10% or whatever it is. Um, it's just people who maybe had five, 10 houses, they maybe had a good income, you know, they maybe made a thousand pound or five thousand pounds and that was they maybe quit their jobs because property became their job all of a sudden you're only making two or three hundred pounds per property whereas you were maybe making five six seven hundred pounds per property before um so yeah there's, there's a big big problem for people that maybe bought portfolios and maybe kept buying and buying and buying over the years and they thought that that was a pension um you thought that they could quit their jobs all of a sudden, they're just not making anything or potentially losing well, money. A, a, a lot of people are going to fall foul of this, aren't they? Because although um, you you can't, under revenue rules, have a, a, a residential property in a pension fund and use the income for a pension fund, um, 
you can, of course, treat property as your pension. Yep. And if that goes, I, I, I think there'll be quite a backlash at the end of the yeah. day. Yeah. Quite, a, quite a backlash. All right, well, there we are. That's all we've got time for in this half of the show. So join me again after the break when we'll be asking Nick and Dave more of your questions. Hello and welcome back to part two of Property Question Time with Dave Ford and Nick Hewitt. Welcome back, guys. Dave, your second question. I'm considering buying a small office block, which is now unused and converted into a residential apartment. Assuming I get planning, are there any particular things I should consider when trying to anticipate any problems with the conversion? I'm only too well aware that unanticipated difficulties, as we all know, cost a lot in terms of time and therefore profit. And I guess I'm thinking, I, I'm thinking there, if I think about this question, uh, a friend of mine bought an ex-telephone exchange and what he could, didn't realise that to take all the, the batteries that they use for backup in these buildings, the, th the floors are this thick. And it was almost impossible to break through and get the ceiling heights that were needed. I mean, it's just that sort of thing that you don't think about, isn't it? Yeah, that, I've, I've come across people who have done that before. Uh, typically when they're buying ex-government buildings like old dull offices and things like that. But to answer your question, I would say on paper, converting an old office block, as long as you do all your planning correctly, should. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be pretty straightforward. Right. But where I see people go wrong is they don't get a proper building survey done. And so my advice to anyone is when you're planning your conversion, obviously you're going to have an architect doing the layout of the new flats. Set aside a contingency budget for a soft strip first. Have that under a separate contract with a builder. Because you better explain what that means. Okay, soft strip. So you, you're looking around there, you look at an office building, it all looks great, you know. Once you start ripping the ceiling down and a lot of walls are covered over and you don't know what's behind there, you could find asbestos, you could find all sorts of things, you know. And um, be very careful on relying on old drawings because I've known it several times in the past where people have looked at the drawings, oh, this is a structural wall, we won't knock that down, we'll knock the next one down, knock the next one down, and the whole thing collapses. Because when it was built originally, people have done it wrong for whatever reason, they didn't care, they didn't realise, and they've just falsified the drawings, you know, and no one's, no one's been aware of it until it comes to renovating it and demolishing it. But I will say to, um, anyone who's considering doing what you're talking about is classed as commercial to residential conversions. Be aware of the new Building Safety Act 2022 that has now brought in a whole load of extra cost and compliance relating to the, the fire plan for that building. Now, if you're not aware of that, you could stack your deal, think it's profitable, get halfway through, someone mentions it to you and you go oh what's that now you look at the cost of it it's not worth doing the project and what sort of thing would that involve is that perhaps the number of apartments per floor or how easily you can get to the lifts or? it's all to do with the fire strategy of that building and the professionals that you need to engage to do the inspections and the paperwork it, it can involve the extensive costs okay and when you're planning your project, okay, your architect's gone through it and he's done all the pretty pictures and the CGI's and shown you what it's going to look like. Who, whose responsibility is to check that sort of thing? Is it a project manager's job? Is it an architect's job? Is no, it... what the Building Safety Act does, it has explicitly now put a legal responsibility onto the client. You can't say when that building burns down and loads of people die, you can't say, well, look, pay the architect, pay the consultant, pay the project manager, pay, pay the builder. I can't be expected to know. The Building Safety Act says, no, you are expected to know. Obviously, you don't have the knowledge, you've got to employ a fire consultant. Right. So it would be a fire consultant as opposed to the normal run of professionals? 
as well and also a competent person as well to check that what the fire consultant has stipulated is actually being carried out on site. And there's a lot of documentation you've got to keep as well. So that, that can come to considerable cost. Sure. No, I, I mean, we, we know the government's trying to encourage the use, of, well, the, the change of use of these sort of buildings, and also particularly on the high streets to sort of redesignate certain spaces there to residential or whatever. Do you, do you think overall it's a, a good plan or do you think we should look to more, you know, new clean developments? No, I think it's a good idea because in COVID, so many businesses went bust shops etc there's all this infrastructure sitting there and you can do these conversions under permitted development you don't need full planning i, I think it, it's a good idea anything that's going to alleviate your housing shortage is a good idea yeah i mean we really do have a problem with this don't we oh massive i i, I think we, we need to build something like two hundred twenty-five thousand dwellings per year just, just just to keep up just to keep up yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and it's just not happening for numerous reasons okay and i do you think that are you finding that the planners are um cooperative in this respect or i mean you know i i, I always hear people say oh crikey you know planning's held us up um the planning officers have been okay but then it's gone to committee and these sort of amateur people have you know put their oar in and Planning is just one of those things, you know, that um, it is getting harder as well for there's new requirements coming out, for example, on new build developments, you've got to provide a 10% net biodiversity gain, <laughs> you know, and other things. But um, going back to the original question, the great thing about doing these conversions, you can do it under permitted development. Sure. You don't need to go through planning. Okay, thank you, Dave. Um, Nick, do you have the same, uh, what's the word, frustrations that we have down here with planners? Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, everyone's biggest headache. Um, and I think when you're when people are doing the smaller end commercial stuff, that like you're talking about changing a shop, maybe into a house, a lot of people jump in because they've maybe done some residential projects, but you're kind of moving into different uh, legalities and regulations. As soon as you start doing commercial stuff, you were talking about the health and safety side, and a lot of people don't take that into account. Um, just what you were talking about, the design aspect as well, they just presume it's the same as the last flat they bought or the last house they bought, and it's a commercial building that's completely different. And all of a sudden, there's a lot more health and safety requirements. The project's a lot bigger than they've got any experience for. That's something that people really need to watch out for. Yeah. Okay, well, good answers. Thank you both, gents. Uh, Nick, uh, your, your last question. Uh, there has been in the past talk of mortgages that are being uh, that are able to be passed down from one generation to another. This was a hot topic when deposits went sky high after the credit crunch in 2010. Do the panel think it's now an appropriate time to visit the idea again with monthly mortgage costs soaring due to riding interest rates? Now, these are the type of mortgages that are quite, quite common on the continent where you know, the mortgage will stay with the family and be passed down and carried on. So it means you can have a 50 or 60 year mortgage, if you like, which, OK, reduces the, the payments, but of course, um, extends, <laughs> extends the time immensely. But it might be the only answer. Might be. Yep. I mean, there's, it's so difficult for young people to get on the property ladder as it is. And, I, and I, I always talk about it. I think, obviously, you look at London where the prices are sky high, but I think 10, 20 years, places like Glasgow, where I'm from, and all the other cities around the UK, the prices are just going to go up and up and up. And it's going to be almost impossible for young kids to get on the property ladder, unless the government obviously do things like the help to buy or, or other schemes. But... Yeah, anything that can help people get on the property ladder, because I, I think it's a big problem for a lot of young kids. I mean, this, this. Uh, I mean, the government like to say, well, you know, you can rely on the bank of mum and dad. I mean, I, th I think that's a terribly dangerous strategy because if you take parents' savings and their 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 equities, that's money that will be going eventually towards their pensions and looking after them. And if you take that away or get it used elsewhere the responsibility is just going to fall on the state, isn't it? Yep, yep. That, that's um, the difficulty. 
And I, you know, I think a lot of young people are also very reticent to take money off their parents. I think, it, you know, I think it's kind of wrong in a way. I mean, are, are your mortgage products in Scotland the same as ours? Is there much difference? More or, or less, yeah. I mean, we pass lots of clients down. The brokers can be in Scotland or England. Yeah, it's the same, the same lenders across the board. Um, some of them aren't too keen for lending up in Scotland. Um, so, but it's, it's all the same. It's all the same companies that we use. What would you say the biggest difference is in developments in Scotland? Would it be sales rates, perhaps, or are they slower there than the UK, perhaps? Possibly, yeah. Um, I mean, you've got places like Glasgow and Edinburgh, um, where, where the, it's always it's always healthy. You know, the market's always booming. Um, but yeah, different different places. A lot of people from down south maybe want to invest up in Scotland because we can get a lot of you get a lot for your money. You know, you can get properties at fifty and a hundred thousand, but you definitely can't get in the south of England. So yeah, you get investors creeping up to the northeast of England or into Scotland. Don't start, we'll all be moving. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Dave? I mean, the, the, this business of uh, mortgages, I mean, I've always had the view, I mean, we, we, you mentioned the, the number of houses we need to build, right? And I've always had the view that developers will always build all the houses you want as long as they can feel sure that the purchase, purchasers can afford the purchase, in other words, fund it properly. So it really does come down to mortgages in the end, doesn't it? Don't you think? Uh, or am I wrong? It comes down, to, yeah, it comes down to affordability, doesn't it? Um, this thing about lifetime mortgages or 60 year mortgages, I don't really know anyone who pays their mortgage off in 25 years anymore. Over the last 20 years, papers, every couple of years, they're remortgaging to pull the equity out. A lot of people, the standard mortgage is 35, 40 years, you know, and- In real terms, in, yeah, in, yeah. In real terms, yeah. And if it's gonna help youngsters to get on the housing ladder, then it's gotta be good. But all this thing about the bank of mum and dad, I've never got nothing off my parents, you know, so- yeah. and the, Me neither. <laughs> the, yeah, the, there's this sort of assumption that there's just half, the population's divided into two halves, youngsters with nothing and their parents with, with abundance and they can just pass it on and it just doesn't Didn't work like, work that, like that. Okay, well gentlemen, that's all we've got time for. So great show, thank you both for your answers. So that's a big thank you to Dave Ford and Nick Gewitt. Thank you both very much indeed for coming in today. I'm Stephen Galpin, join me again next time on Property Questions.